All right, boys and girls, welcome back. Sam's Army, episode 2.235. We got a lot to talk about this week. We're going to start out with headlines. Talk San Diego, U.S. men's, men's national team midfielders, and Caleb Williams. Weekly What If, the World Crap Cup. Premier League, we'll talk Chelsea's collapse, Live VAR, Pool and uh, Manchester Derby preview. Around the world, we got an MLS preview, MLS playoff preview. Get your minds right, and then stoppage time with Ivan Tony's best bets and everyone's favorite segment, Goas. Okay, now it is time to bring in this week's panel of big brain beauties, starting with Tweedle number one, Tommy McGunner, fresh off of season number. What season was that for you, Tommy, as a pro? Uh, five. Season five in the books, a grizzled veteran. Uh, you can see it from his, you know, mustache that, you know, says he's been around the world and, and back. Um, so quick question. We're going to stray from soccer real quickly and go to the gridiron. The people uh, demand to know an answer to this. Yes or no. Did you rush the field after the Notre Dame game when they beat USC the other weekend? I did not. Did I it cross your mind? <laughs> uh, so my, my cousin, came to the game with us and it was his first time out to campus. And that was the only time it crossed my mind was a, it's his first time at the stadium. We were right by like the USC band and the USC fans. Like I asked him like, do you want to go? And he's like, no, I'm, I'm good. And I, I think there were too many stairs and too many drinks involved at that point that that was probably the best decision. Fair enough. Fair. I was, I was wondering, cause I, I didn't, I would have thought maybe I, you'd put something I have in your done, story. I, if you did. I have done it in the past though. You have done it. Okay. All right. Yeah. You've been there, done that. It's nothing new for you. Okay. Uh, Tweedle number two, fresh off a transatlantic flight from England where he caught his, I think you said it was his fir- your first uh, Premier League game over the weekend uh, and shot some content with new friend of a friend of the pod, Jack Grealish. Uh, so give us the highlights and lowlights, if there were any, uh, of your uh, trip to England, Mr. Mitchell Goulet, a.k.a. Overtime Mitch. It, uh, it was my first Premier League game, and it was pretty sick, I'm not going to lie. Um, little hospitality suite, food was immaculate, there's a FIFA set up in there. Like, I don't know why everybody just doesn't go to games like that every time, you know? Um, it was cool, though. We uh, I got access to Kyle Walker, Ederson, Manuel Akanji, and uh, Jack Grealish. All just like great dudes. Did something different on, con- or, uh, on camera with each one of them. Kyle Walker was phenomenal. That dude... That dude has been around the league and back, uh, and I'm really excited for that content because we did a little crossbar challenge, and I'm not going to say I hit it first try, but hit it first try, and his reaction directly to camera is, like, priceless. He's like, oh, okay, this guy can ball. I've never felt I've never felt higher on a football pitch than when Kyle Walker, like, shook my hand after hitting crossbar first try. Um, it was cool, though. That, I think that was the highlight. Jack Grealish was an absolute lad. Um, I did get – some of uh some of the questions off some people dm'd me from the pod last week and said hey can you ask jack this and that uh they will probably not make the video but um he's a good dude and it's a great trip you know nice nice and you did you only it was the brighton manchester city game was that the only game you got to yeah that's the only one i got to okay well uh yeah you're getting a little respect from a from a premier league player as a soccer athlete so yeah i'd call that a win for the weekend um, even outside of the content side, which I'm sure went down well. All right, headlines time. So the 30th MLS team slated to begin playing in 2025 and located, of course, in Wales Vagina, uh, unveiled their name and logo last week. San Diego FC, very clever, very creative, uh, with a crest uh, and logo with colors of chrome and azul, chrome and blue. Um, the immediate response, I will say, on social media was, um, uh, how do I put this? Not favorable, not very favorable, uh, pretty negative. Uh, Mitch, overall, what uh, what's your th- thoughts on this um, uh, big reveal? Um, yeah, I'm with the, the hordes of people that think it's like a really weird badge. It doesn't look like a football club's badge at all. Um, I'm also here to criticize the name choice that every MLS expansion team that has happened or, you know, that has occurred in the last, what, 15 years has been FC or United. Yet we're a country that demands calling it soccer. I just, it doesn't make sense to me. Now, fact check on that. You're, you're <laughs> just in general, you're right. Yep. But it was, it's since 2015. 
Every oh, okay. single name has been, you know, a city name, boilerplate gotcha. city name with FC or SC. There has been some SCs in there. Just throw okay. that out there. Uh, but it's either city name and FC slash SC or city name and United. Ever since 2015, that's all we've got. We used to be a proper soccering nation. We used to have stuff like the Clash. Ah, oh, man. The burn Revolution. Wizards. The Burn, right? The Revolution. Still a great name. Um, I think one of the luxuries of putting out like your brand identity this early and kind of taking the temperature is you can change it. Who can't like <laughs> jerseys aren't printed right now. Uh, just get, you're playing in 2025, change it, like workshop something different. Who cares? I will say the logo. I mean, you know, they always come out with all these, you know, explainers with all the little arrows yeah, pointing at this so dumb stop that just stop that cool. um the there's two things about the logo number one it's really boring like really boring and then you then you got the whole issue with um people are looking at san diego fc as being the you know murderer of san diego loyal and loyal has a pretty cool badge and colors and everything and then you've also got the san diego wave who I think did a pretty good job with their crest and colors, as, by the way, NWSL pretty much always does. They always kind of eat MLS's um, lunch money or eat, eat MLS's... Me and my mixed metaphors, I'm, I'm just really good with this stuff. Anyway, so they, they, they came in kind of against the backdrop of these two logos and names that were, I think people were, you know, in favor of. And then they come out with this badge that was, I mean, it's mostly gray. And we're talking yeah. San Diego. Right. And it's mostly gray with some weird little shape. I don't know. It just it was not overwhelming. It was very much underwhelming. Tommy, any any thoughts on the name or the colors or any of this? Yeah, I mean, I get the I get the name just because that's what everyone's doing. But all those teams have pretty sweet badges that resonate with the city. Like St. Louis City has the arches in it. Uh, Minnesota has loons in it. Um, FC Cincinnati has a lion like. All these things that you'd be like, okay, the name isn't original, but like I identify with the badge. I don't feel like anyone's identifying with the name or the badge. And I think like the San Diego wave almost reminds me of like Endless Summer. And then San Diego Loyal, I think is a great crest with with waves and everything. It's like, you got to do something with the ocean being in San Diego or like a surfer or something outdoors and bright, like... <laughs> No, no, it that that would be perfect if you're living in, uh, I don't know, like in the Midwest where it's like a permacloud for for six months of the year, like something gray at that point. But uh, yeah, I'm not a fan of both. But like, I get the name just because everyone's doing it. The logo has to be better though. Yep, I think we're all on the same page here. And as Mitch said, you got plenty of time. You can always rethink and redo, and you know, pull a. Who, who who did all the changes? Chicago Fire obviously did an immediate redesign. Didn't didn't Columbus Montreal. Crew? Montreal did one. Montreal, Columbus Crew. Did it. They changed the it, name or something is like recent. that. There's this recent though. They had yeah. that hard hat for a long, long time, which is yeah. a pretty sweet logo. Ah uh, yes. Oh well. Um, well, plenty of time to rethink it if you if you want to. There, San Diego. All right, move on. So. Bournemouth announced that Tyler Adams has undergone another surgery on his hamstring, and that is going to keep him out until February. Um, he's only played one game and only yeah, like 20 minutes of one game. Uh, it was last month against Stoke um, since joining from Leeds on a five year deal. You know, it's interesting that I, I heard from somebody who really would know that ham, uh, Tyler's hamstring was not good even before he you know the deal went through with Bournemouth uh the person thought he might not even pass the physical but you know obviously he did and and that's good news but man this is scary uh at this point how many issues he's having with the hamstring he's going to miss the home and home against Trinidad and Tobago which is scheduled for November which is essentially uh, a Copa America qualifier at this point um, I mean, obviously we, we should, you know, that should not, not be make or break whether Tyler Adams plays in that, but you know, the, the, the continued repeated 
problems he's having with his hammy. And as somebody who has, for the first time in my life, I've been dealing with like a hamstring injury for the last couple months. Number one, it sucks. Uh, I'm hoping that since he's like 22 and I'm like, you know, not twice that, but I'm a lot closer to twice that than, than once that, uh, you know, it'll be a little different for him in terms of the recovery. I don't know. How scared should we be at this point? Tommy, I feel like you've, you've got some injuries in your past, don't you? Or have you been somehow injury free? <laughs> I, I've been very fortunate slash lucky with that. Um, and I don't move as fast as Tyler, so I don't have hamstring issues. Uh, it's I think it's like it's a byproduct of him just like being such a hard worker and giving everything he has whenever he steps on the pitch. Um, and then I think maybe it's genetic. I I, I don't know obviously all the details, but that's got to be so frustrating. You see the same thing with Gio Reyna. Like it's and Pulisic went through a version of it too with hamstrings. It's just it's that's a really tough one to come back early from because I think that's when you see a lot of people re-injure it. And I'm sure he was very professional about the rehab and eager to get back, eager to get to his new club and impress early. And then it's just unfortunate that that happened. Yeah, pretty much. And now he's out till February after another surgery. So yeah, I, I don't think there's really anything, anything we can say other than, you know, I hope the recovery goes well and, uh, you know, he could borrow some of Weston. I feel like McKenney is always coming back from injuries like months earlier than he's supposed to. So maybe take some, I don't know, share some notes or something. But or get, maybe we'll send him some of that, uh, what is it, the cow placenta from uh, Eastern Europe? That seems to allegedly, I don't know where I'm coming up with this stuff, but I definitely heard somebody got some cow placenta and, you know, it helped their hamstrings at some point. Somebody back me up on that. What kind of dealer do you got? I don't, I don't know. know. It didn't help me. This is just, you know, I heard this through the internet. Let's, let's be clear. <laughs> um, but yeah, obviously best wishes to Tyler. Hope he's back sooner rather than later. Um, from one Captain America to another, Michael Bradley. So Michael Bradley announced his retirement last week. Um, and in a move that seems extremely on brand for him, he took precisely zero days off after Toronto's last game of the season. He immediately flew over to Norway and joined the, to the coaching staff for Stabæk, uh, where his dad, Bob Bradley, uh, Bob Bradley was named the head coach in September. <laughs> so he's, he's right back at it, but you know, the, in the immediate aftermath of his announcement saying he was going to hang up uh, his cleats, you know, the, the response on social media was interesting. Uh, there were a lot of different opinions, I suppose, as there always is, but I would have thought maybe in, you know, somebody cl closing out their career, a career that, you know, he spent years and years playing at the top level. He was among the best midfielders that we've probably ever had in the U S um, you know, national team program, the, the negativity that I, that I sensed was it was palpable. So what I wanted to do is get a sense from you guys, you know, when you think of Michael Bradley and his career, what, what's going to stand out, you know, for you, Mitch. Um, anybody speaking negatively about a player at the end of their career, like in light of their retirement announcement is probably like looking for clicks or doesn't have an actual great idea of that player's body of work. Like Michael Bradley is one of the best American midfielders ever. And there's no reason that he should be anything but celebrated for this career because he's had such an impact on this team. He's, he's been in the side. Like there were, there were camps where, I grew up with Michael Bradley and then I started paying taxes and then I graduated college. And then I was like, Oh my God, he's still in this team. Like he is that much of an iron man for this U S men's national team. Um, he I'll, I'll remember him as bald. Um, and, and I really like his move of, uh, announcing his retirement and then immediately going to join the coaching staff. Don't quit your job until you got another one lined up. I really love that from him. <laughs> smart, smart. Yeah. And also just so on brand that you, what you hear from, you know, people who play with or kind of know the Bradleys, they are so like committed 
yeah. to the sport <laughs> that like it's just so on brand that he immediately went straight from playing to coaching um tommy what about you you know what do you what do you what comes to mind or what will come to mind about michael bradley's career um moving forward yeah i mean he was one of my role models favorite players growing up um my dad played for bob bradley at princeton um so i think I'll always have like a, an affection or an affinity for that family and what they've done for us soccer and specifically mine. Um, so yeah, I think all good things. And I think he's no nonsense, straight shooter. He'd tell you exactly when he was on the top of his game and probably the best American player we had. And when he, and when he wasn't, um, and that's something I really respect. And yeah, like you said, anyone who knows the Bradleys, classic classic move he just goes from one to the next just like that like that is that is very on brand so right and and also i mean i love the move in this you know 2023 year of our lord where people you know take a whole year of like their retirement and tell people and they get the, like the the parades and the uh, fucking gifts and the whatever the you know tributes and whatever every single stadium they went to michael's just like yeah i'm out see you guys later i'm going to norway <laughs> i mean like i love that about him but also you know he's taking a step back like as mitch said like the people who are really hating on on him you know you must not be a you must not have been around very long i i think because first of all michael bradley was over in europe playing in roma you know roma at bundesliga teams he was earning respect for american soccer players abroad way before you know, this new sort of generation has taken it, obviously, to the next level. Um, and he was doing it when very few other people were doing that. Um, and, you know, then he came back. Um, he carried Toronto, well, helped carry to Toronto to heights that they have not, uh, they had not seen and they have definitely not seen since. Um, you know, they won the treble, I think his trophy hall. So he had two gold cups with the national team, uh, six trophies with toronto fc one mls cup one shield and four toronto championships um and you know there were just some there were some trademark moments that will go down in history when he chipped uh pube puff in the azteca i mean that was one of the top highlights of my u.s soccer fan career and it will always be um and just the way he went about things like i remember two things that stand out that won't necessarily go down in like you know will be written about in books and go on twitter two things number one there was the the time when zlatan got up in his face and was giving him the business and michael bradley unlike pretty much every player i've ever seen mls europe wherever bradley was just like fuck off he was sort of like talking back to him they were just having a conversation zlatan was mad michael bradley looked like he's like couldn't give a fuck and he was like just zoned in on the game which again, makes a lot of sense uh, for Bradley. But there was that, not backing down from Zlatan, one of the few people that I, you know, that you see do that. Number two was in the last couple seasons with Toronto FC, when they have struggled mightily, uh, every time, and I haven't watched them nearly as much because I'm not a masochist, but I, the games that I did watch and he was out there playing, he was just as committed and dedicated to you know, success and looking like he was getting on players and he wanted to win. Whereas a lot of the guys out there were either over, it, it just, it didn't look like they were uh, into it on the same, at the same level that Bradley was a hundred percent committed. He was getting on guys' asses. He wanted to win. And uh, it, it just, it struck me as like, wow, this guy is like the consummate professional and he just wants to play soccer. And now he just wants to coach soccer. Um, so it's, yeah, there's a lot of sort of, I don't know, facets to his life and his, his career, but the, the hating, you know, I know we all know where it stems from, right. It, it all pretty much all stems from the, the failure to qualify for the 2018 world cup. And, you know, I actually thought it was, I thought it was as an idiot, as a fan, as a person who was angry and whatever about not making the world cup in the moment, I thought it was kind of funny that U S fans were giving him and Josie the business for, you know, a year or two afterwards, but looking back, first of all, it wasn't their fault that the entire Federation fucked up. And number two, at a certain point, it's time to get over that and realize, you know, they weren't, they weren't the ones that, that 
you know, cost us going to the World Cup. They're obviously involved, but so was everybody else involved. So anyway, um, I thought he was unfairly maligned. And so I figured we should at least discuss it a little bit. All right. Last headline, Caleb Williams. So last week, a lot of headlines about the USC quarterback who Tommy went and saw lose the other week, um, who is, you know, he's kind of in line to maybe the, the top pick in the NFL draft. So stories are coming out reportedly suggesting that he's hoping to get an ownership stake in whatever team ends up drafting him. So this got me thinking, and this is not a conversation. This is a conversation that we've had before. I remember when Mbappe was signed with PSG. And sort of the there were all, a lot of bells and whistles, some some keys to the castle that were handed over, not an ownership stake. But at the time, whenever that deal was signed, <clears throat> I said that it's only going to be a matter of time until a player, you know, or, or players start asking for ownership stakes in teams. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so while I don't think Caleb Williams has any shot in hell of getting an ownership stake as like an untested rookie. Like no chance, but on in, in the European soccer stage, when you've got a guy like Messi, when you got a guy like Mbappe, the amount of leverage they have and the amount of sort of, you know, uh, what they can, what they can demand from a team, I think it's only a matter of time. And I see nothing but positives from it, nothing but positives for the player. They're more invested in that club. That's great for fans. You know, that player is going to be hundred percent committed. You know, they're probably not going to go anywhere. Um, I, I just see a lot of positives from a lot of different angles. The only negatives would be to the billionaire fat cats and they would have less of an ownership stake, which I don't really oh, give no. a shit, which I don't really give a shit about on that. So uh, Tommy, I don't know. You feel like your soccer business brain is always, uh, you know, firing uh, neurons. Is the, am I wrong on this? Do, number one, do you think it's going to happen? And number two, am I right that like, there's no negatives. I, I, I failed to see some negatives in this situation. You brought this up so we could say that you were right. Yeah, I did. I did. I totally set this up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, hopefully. Tommy might have something to make me feel like an idiot. Wouldn't be the first time. I think you've got a point that I could see this happening for sure. I think it's like, I mean, obviously MLS does a version of it now with Messi, Beckham, et cetera, sure. like yeah. their own twisted version of it but it's i think it's much easier to do it with a league with the tv rights and everything like that's what the players want to tap into really um i wonder how that would impact like the valuation of clubs like let's say you have mbappe and he becomes an owner but he's also an asset and he's worth like 200 300 million dollars will they try to leverage that or like i i wouldn't i would be curious how that would work out um and then also, I think the type of players right now that are asking for that would probably most of us would consider prima donnas. Mercenaries. So, so what happens when that person just naturally throws a fit and doesn't want to play anymore? <laughs> right. Especially for that club when things go yeah. badly. Yeah. And when yeah. we were talking, you know, Messi, I don't know if you can call Messi a mercenary given his, you know, years and years of service with Barcelona, but Mbappe, he seems like a guy that, that could – you know, show up at Real Madrid next season and then maybe show up at, you know, Man City three seasons after that. Um, so, yeah, I think that's a fair concern. But at the end of the day, that's a problem that owners will have to deal with. And I don't really give a shit about that. Uh, Mitch, any thoughts? Yeah, I think um, I think there's no way in hell Caleb Williams gets it. But no. I really like the balls that he has to ask. I think there's only a handful of players in the world right now that that's even a conversation about with ownership. Um, but I really think that I, I don't see a downside. Um, if a player is invested in the, like, you know, has a stake in the club, they are incentivized to stay there longer. They're incentivized more like it's always a chore to get players to do the commercial stuff to get players to push ticket sales, to get players to push jersey sales. Not that they're required to, but like from a club's perspective, that is something that you would like your star player to do because it just means more coming from their mouth or their Instagram. And if they are now way more financially incentivized to do that, you will see stronger like alignment between player and club 
on commercial activity. And that is one of the good things that the owners can expect if they were to give stake for those big, big, big names. Um, I does I do think Tommy brings up a good point that that gets murky when people are looking to sell a club or transfer a player or a player wants to leave that like, what does that look like? If a player has a ton of stake in a club and relationships have gone sour, this is that club's star striker. And he says, I got to knock this week and the next week and the next week after that. And I'm not playing. Sorry. Um, I, I want to leave. Like you are not only tanking points, but you're tanking not to, again, not to say that any players would do that, but like that's a possibility. Um, it's a risk that those gajillionaires are going to have to take at some point. But I do think that here, Sam, record this one. Sam was right. Um, a couple of months uh, ago. Clip it, Dalton. <laughs> I do think that it can happen and will happen sometime in the future, near future. Yeah. Do I just you, think do you players think are it, getting so much leverage now, dummy. Do you think it happens in response to like financial fair play? Oh shit, we don't have enough money to pay this guy as a mm. soccer player. Or transfer fee. Mistakes, right. Maybe. Yeah. yeah. I mean we're gonna have to rewrite the financial fair play rules that are already not followed <laughs> when we start giving deals with stake in them. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it, it has the potential to get ugly, and I bet, things to I bet go the south. NBA, I bet the NBA does it before. That's exactly just, what I was just gonna say. The NBA yeah. players have so much leverage, and I think that's probably where it will start. And then yeah. you know they'll have to. I, I think it would go NBA, global soccer, mm-hmm. yeah, American that, football. I don't know football or baseball. I don't know how they fit into it. I just know that I, what my guess would be NBA. Followed by European soccer. That's and, we're, and we're I think that's just like out. the number of players they play with on the field or court plus yeah. on the roster. Like NBA player has more influence over a franchise. They're, yeah, they're so much more valuable. Starting five. Okay, uh, listen, it's an interesting concept, and I think we'll probably have more opportunities to discuss it <laughs> in the future. So we'll leave it there for now. Um, all right, weekly what if time. So I've seen this concept bouncing around the interwebs uh, over the last couple of weeks. And I feel like it's not the first time I've seen it, but for some reason, it seems like it may have gained a little more traction this time. There are people suggesting <clears throat> that FIFA need to run a second tournament, very similar to the World Cup. I, I would call it the World Crap Cup, because according to this tweet, according to a lot of people retweeting and responding, being like, this would be awesome. They think that FIFA should run a tournament that involves the 32 countries with the lowest ranking. So not, you know, the top, the top tier teams, the lowest 32, we're talking about like the, there's probably a lot of uh, Caribbean teams that would be up for it here, but like the Dominicas, uh, but not just, you know, Caribbean, we got Chad's Mauritius, Cambodia, um, you know, sort of the, the lowest of the low in the FIFA rankings and run it as a world cup style, I don't know if you'd expand it to 48. That might be a little extra, but like, you know, maybe 16, 32. And this would be a tournament that people would actually care about and get into. And, and you know, there'd be positives, right? You'd be, there'd be teams that have no chance in, in hell of ever going to a World Cup. And you'd give them a chance to, you know, play on the world stage, kind of. Um, what do you think, Mitch? Yes or no? Are you in or are you out? I think a couple things need to change for me to be in. One, it does need to be 48 teams. Uh, because if you are the 33rd worst team in the world and you're not included and you don't get that international spotlight, you're pissed. Um, <laughs> what about the 49th? Sucks. Um, also, I think this can't be run exactly like a World Cup. I think this needs to be an entirely different format of tournament. Maybe it's single elimination bracket style. Um Maybe it's, yeah, no, maybe, maybe it's just single elimination bracket style with the bottom 64 teams in the world. Fuck it. Make it a March Madness of just ugly ass football. I would watch that a hundred percent. We put it all within a month and a half, make it every four years, just like the world cup offset it for like two years, do it during a time that there's no euros. There's no Copa America. There's no gold cup or whatever. And yeah, I'm in. Okay. I mean, when you change it to a single elimination where you could kind of get done with the tournament kind of quickly, right? 
now I'm I'm more on the fence about it. At first, I was like, this is a terrible oh, idea. If you, you want to really go watch can't. shit soccer, just go to your local high school and watch the freshman, you know, or JV game. There's no stakes to that, though. And There's no stakes really, to this either. Nobody knows any of the players. There's, a, there's absolutely stakes. There's there's single, like, there's a trophy at the end. I don't know. Maybe it's a toilet. But there's a trophy at the end. And you, But you don't care about a team in the group stage of this tournament. You as a neutral do not care about a team in the group stage, just like you as a neutral only care about a March Madness team when you've chosen them in your bracket. You don't actually care about like Florida Gulf Coast University, but you do want them to, you know, upset that third seed. I do care about Florida Dunk, Dunk City. That's a, they had an electric run, but like this needs to be single el- elimination. People don't care for long enough. Right. You can't, with the group stage, you got to get rid of that. So, yeah. Tommy, you get rid of the group stage. You do single elimination. You enter out. Yeah, is it like winner moves on or loser moves on? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I like that. It's a good question. Like, and you just skew the bonuses the other way. Like, <laughs> if you you have if you to win have the, the winner round, move on, you get your bonus. Would not, everybody would be scoring on their own goal. Uh, great question, but you have to. It has to be the best of the worst. It can't be. We can't be trying okay. to find the worst of the worst. That's not going to work. Uh, yeah, I think I'd be in. I think I'm. Uh, I'm with Mitch here. One game per team. Okay, I'm. I'm at least lukewarm on the idea. Before I hated it, and I just I was using this as an excuse to hopefully people see the light and realize this is a stupid idea and stop retweeting that stupid idea. But now you guys have kind of sold me just a little bit on the single elimination. Make it quick and in and out. Okay. All right. At least I'm 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 willing to hear more ideas on this now. Whereas before I just wanted to shit on it. Okay. Premier League time. <clears throat> we had uh, an interesting uh weekend of games. Chelsea and Arsenal fought to a two-two draw. Liverpool came away, I wouldn't say limped away, but came away with uh, a two-zero. I don't know. Disappointing win over Everton at home, no less. Villa put uh, put a hurt on West Ham. Those are some of the the highlights. But Tommy, let's go with you. Which game uh, or which result did you find most interesting, and why? Yeah, Chelsea Arsenal. I think. Um, I think Chelsea probably hasn't been getting the respect or applause that they should be based on the performances not the results that they've been getting uh under Pochettino and they were much better than I was expecting especially for the first 70 minutes and then Arsenal was a lot worse than I was expecting uh I thought that was the worst that they've played especially in the first half in a long long time um and to still get a result out of that you know I think everyone's going to twist it saying you know that's what champions do you get a result early in the season where you were awful in the first half away from home and you just pull something out late in the game. Um, but yeah, I think Chelsea's going to be a, a much, I know their stretch of games is brutal coming up now, but they're a much better team than I think a lot of people who watch that game thought. Now, if you look at their team individually, they have a lot of talent, right? I mean, they have some talent on that team. They've just been terrible. And it's been like, it seems like a, a confidence thing where the, every, the results were going bad. So confidence wasn't there. And then it just sort of snowballed. It does feel like Chelsea, you know, whether maybe Pochettino finally got a hold of things and got sort of the, their minds right. They did look different in this game. And I think they've actually been playing a little bit better recently. Um, but yeah, that I think the, what was it? Until that Declan Rice goal, which was, I don't know what minute that was in, but until that goal, um, you know, Chelsea looked good. That goal seemed to wake you guys up. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> it was in the 77th minute. So 76 minutes, uh, 76 minutes of good from Chelsea, and then they kind of collapsed at the end. Mitch, what did you think? Uh, about yeah, that? They've been better over the past three weeks, um, performance-wise and result-wise. I think they've just gained confidence, like a lot of what Tommy said, that they um, – They've kind of found their footing under Pochettino. And like you said, they do have a lot of talent. I didn't, I wasn't able to watch like the full game. So I just watched the highlights, um, but disappointed with the result. We'll take a point. Um, 
I'm a little worried though, based on what I've heard and the minimal highlights that I watched that we just didn't look great. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty much it. You guys, I think Tommy said it. You guys did not look good. This was this was definitely sort of the worst I've seen from Arsenal for a while. Um, you know, I, I, I think, didn't think I think the games are catching up to them. Think so? You, so you Indi- think the competitions are starting to stack up and yeah, and then the better they play, the more their guys get called up for international duty. The more they're called up, they're still in form, they're still playing well for the international team. And so it just adds up, I think. Makes sense. Especially for a lot of um, younger guys. Well, that's, I mean, that's that's kind of one of those concerns that, you know, could get worse. <laughs> Unfortunately for you guys, I can root for it. Um, other games, there were a lot of red cards this week, by the way. I think it was like four red cards. Burnley, Bournemouth, Man City got one right at the end by Akanji, your, your boy. I talked uh, to him about it afterwards. And he was oh, like, did you? You talked to him afterwards? Yeah, he said it was. He said it was necessary. Like he knew it was coming as soon as he made that tackle. He was like, "Yeah, that's my second yellow." Um, <laughs> side note, Akanji. I asked him about American sports. That guy knows more about American sports than like a lot of people that I work with at overtime. That dude. I asked him what position he would play in American football, and he and I expected like, "Oh, I'd like to play offense," and he was like, "Well." I think I'd like to play free safety because it allows me more freedom to roam than like a strong safety. And I feel like I could have a great vantage point. I feel like I could intercept really well and communicate. And I was like, damn, bro, that, that was a really that's well a, thought that's, out answer. That's a center back right there. That's, that's what he's I'm also, saying. He's also wicked smart, I think. Yeah. Oh, like, yeah. He's really, really, math. really smart. Yeah. Was he the guy that was doing all those math? Like, yeah, just like, yeah. Math. Um, he just, he just seems that. like a very smart dude. He is. He, um, very like very well read um nba fan as well huge oklahoma city thunder fan we talked about the celtic like just just an absolute lad um but yeah he they uh i talked to him about that red card and he was like yep that was that was expected um needed to kill that momentum in the moment but it was it was right at the end they were only up one stinks for him he's gonna miss the manchester derby next weekend but that's that's what happens um aston villa they're kind of a wagon. What are they in like fifth place right now? My Emery deserves some flowers. We uh, two not not that we necessarily deserve credit, but we have been saying for quite a while now. Yeah, they, they just seem yeah. like a new team under him. Uh, they don't really have any holes now that they got Ollie Watkins sort of you know up top doing his thing. It's like Emmy Martinez is you know a top notch goalkeeper. Uh, they just. They don't have any holes. They they just seem like a I said this about West Ham too, a team that I just would not want to face. And then they went in and just clapped West Ham. So yeah, Aston Villa, add them to the list of a team that I really, really do not want to uh face right at the moment. <clears throat> um other results, Liverpool, Liverpool, all that whining, all that crying. Not not crying now, are they? I know Tyler and Dalton are not going to like to hear this, but basically, you know, they've been, I know that it's the Twitter algorithm or the, uh, you know, threads algorithm that like I've seen so many goddamn Liverpool fans still to this day crying about the the Tottenham game. And I'm not actually going to blame that on like all Liverpool fans. I know it's just the algorithm. I stupidly like clicked on it or watched, hovered over it too long. And the technology is, pigeonholed me as you know some idiot who who is you know if not wants to wants to hate view all these twitter uh Liber- liverpool fans complaining about the condom game liverpool got lucky like there is no two ways about it in this everton game everton this was sean dyche being sean dyche he had everton coming in there like gunning and in gunning is i'm using that sort of loosely for a zero zero draw that's what he wanted from the moment they started that game. And it looked like for however, 70 some minutes, it looked like they, they were going to get it. Liverpool just did not get anything going. Um, Kanate should, and this was after they got a red card. Ashley Young got a red card in the first half. They seemed to weather that they Liverpool against 10 men, Everton still at home at Anfield, they could not get anything going. And then the Kanate should have got a red card. 
Like there was a, it was a second yellow card. It was pretty clear as day. Uh, very similar to Ashley Young's first yellow card. I don't know how, you know, this isn't a VAR thing, right? That's the, that's the ref who decided not to give him. And I don't think VAR can intervene on a situation like that, but then VAR, VAR did intervene on the handball where uh, I don't know who crossed it, but it hit Michael Keane's hand. There was a lot of discussion about that call and whether it should have been a handball. I personally thought it, the, the call was VAR was probably right. And I, I was okay with them giving a handball on that play. I prefer that just left, let the, you know, ref deal with it on the field, but listen, his hand was not next to his body. I know that when you jump, your arms can move a little bit and they have to move just the way, you know, the body goes, but his hand was out there. He was making his body bigger. And so I was okay with the fact that VAR gave him the handball, but there's no denying that Liverpool got very, very fortunate and to come away, and you know, the second goal, obviously, once you get the first, the second goal is is just uh, uh, a lot easier. It's just at least, at least, the best part about this is that Liverpool fans can shut the fuck up for a little while. That that makes me happy about this. On the Everton side, it's just like over and over again. Like Everton, I almost feel like they just need to go get relegated and hit reset and start over because they're going through the same you know, uh, mediocrity to lower bottom half mediocrity year after year after year. And like, is Sean Dice really going to be the one to take you out of that? Probably not. I just think they need a hard reset. Um, any thoughts on the Liverpool game, Mitch? I didn't watch it. So no. Yeah. It, I mean, it was terrible. It was not fun. <laughs> it was not fun. Soccer watching. Uh, I'll say that and also six 30, of course. Uh, on a Saturday morning. So only those of us with, you know, screaming kids or uh, Liverpool Everton affiliations were up watching it. Um, What other games? Tottenham Fulham. I mean, top of the table Tottenham is, is fun. I've been saying it for weeks. Like, yeah, we're not going to be there forever, but I'm going to enjoy it while we do. I mean, it's just, this team is fun and just got us moving. Sun is back. Madison is incredible. I've never fallen in love with somebody faster than James Madison this season. I am all in on him. Uh, our back line, specifically our center back duo, I, I couldn't love any more. Even our key goalkeeper, Vicario, comes out of nowhere. He's even good. So I'm just, I'm in love with this team. I know it's only a matter of time until my heart gets ripped out and stomped into a Bolivian, but for the moment, this team is fun and top four is absolutely on the table. Is title? No. We're not going to win this fucking thing. No goddamn no goddamn way. But top four is on the table and I I just love that. I'm just happy. It's it's fun being a, you know, we've, we've been through the wars uh, of, you know, mediocrity. You guys, you guys know what it's all about. To come out the other side, I mean, you guys are at least fighting for a title, so it's a little bit different. Uh, but you know, just keep I'm playing happy. it cool. Keep playing it cool. Yeah. <laughs> I am. I will I, say I got no time. I'll give ambitions. you. I, I will give Spurs props on two things. Obviously, they're really fun to watch. But my favorite thing about it is they are the talk of the league right now as the surprise, like yeah. Arsenal was last year. That stress, like unknown tense feeling amongst fans players it wears in april so <laughs> i'm happy that arsenal can just kind of go under the radar no pressure someone will be the pigeon or sorry I'm someone will be the that. rabbit they'll tail off and then i mean if we're still talking place. like this in april i will be over the moon i think it'll i think we'll come i hope up. i hope it's all the way till april <laughs> I do too. that's that's a very good rabbit well i'll give you rabbit of the year if you guys do that listen if we're, if we're in if we go all the way to april as the rabbit there's no chance that happens but if, if we go that far then we must have top four locked in so i will be absolutely yeah i mean look look at arsenal last year city won three months in a row but barely anyone spoke about them until the last three weeks it's true. We all knew what was happening. And then we will, we will definitely all know if, if Tottenham's the bunny, we are a, a dead bunny rabbit at some point. Um, other games. Let's see. Let's see. Manchester United got a win. Let's give them some credit. 
It doesn't happen often. Uh, Newcastle put a hurt on Crystal Palace. Luton Town, who has gotten a lot of shit. You know, they they were down 2 nothing at Forest, and they came back in with two goals in, I think, the last 10 minutes or so. Um, so it shows that they're still, you know, out there fighting. So shout out, Luton. Uh, Burnley. I don't know when they're going to turn it around, but man, 3-0. And, you know, they got a red card, but the red card wasn't until the end. They were thoroughly beaten by Brentford, who hasn't been all that great this season. Not good. And Bournemouth, by the way. We're going to get the power rankings right now. Bournemouth is awful. Bournemouth is just, they're, they're fighting for uh, the 20th spot in power rankings. I think this is probably going to be the fastest power rankings uh, that we've ever done. I'll go first. I'm just going to keep it. the. Ex- I don't think anything changed my mind, top or bottom. I, th- I still have the same seven in the same order. I got City first, Arsenal second, Liverpool third, Tottenham fourth on the top. And then I got um, Sheffield bottom, bottom. Although, you know, shout out to Austin Trusty, who has been playing well. Um, and doesn't get a lot of love. I feel like that guy, we should talk about him a little bit more, maybe. Um, Sheffield 20th, Bournemouth 19, and Luton Town 18. So there, there's all seven of mine. Anybody got a, I know you guys last week had Arsenal up top, followed by City, right? Yeah. You going to stick with that? Stop. No. No, <laughs> not after that. <laughs> I'll give it to, I'll give it to Spurs. I'll go Spurs, Arsenal, City, and then probably Liverpool. you're putting us up top. Are you doing a Mikey and just doing this reverse jinx thing? Someone got it. No, it, like City's lost three of the last four. Arsenal's lost one, tied. Spurs. I mean, obviously they're not playing midweek, so it's a lot fewer games, but <laughs> they've won like six or seven in a row, I want to say. Only team and they without tied Arsenal. And they tied Arsenal away. So Yeah. All right. All right. I I I accept your rationale as opposed to Mikey's blind blank. And they uh, always have City's number. So that's true. That's true. We which means that now that we're actually playing well, which means City would stop us. Uh, yeah, that's how that flips. <laughs> always. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Mitch, are you going Spurs up top? I'm not. You wish. Um, I'll take City up top, just based off of um, what I've seen this weekend. I will put Arsenal at second. I'll put Spurs at third. Um, if we're going based on your neutral ground rule, uh, and then Liverpool at fourth. I am going to take Luton out of my bottom three for the result that they've got this weekend. And I'm going to put Burnley in. I I still have that same bottom two of Sheffield Bournemouth, but uh, Burnley at, at the last or the 18th spot, I suppose. Been singing, their prayer, been singing their prayer, but like, I, I can't hang on to that for too much longer. They don't look good. They don't. They don't. I'm still stuck on like how good they were last year in the championship and me, my expectations for them this season, but man, they've been bad. (laughs) They've been, it's probably not fair to, to Luton town that I have keeping Luton town in there and Burnley is not in my bottom three, but if they, if Burnley pulls one more sort of just absolutely terrible result. Oh, wow. They get Bournemouth this coming weekend. If they can't be Bournemouth, they are a hundred percent going to be in that bottom three. All right, weekend preview. One this this weekend, I gotta be honest. Um not a lot of games that that sort of reach out and grab me. Obviously, there's the one. There's the Manchester Derby on Sunday. Um, but other than that, not not a lot going on this weekend, if I'm being honest. So we'll we'll start with that though. Um, Manchester Derby, Mitch. I guess we got to go with you. You got some, in, you got all the inside knowledge on on City at this point. Does you know? Does United? Would you give United a snowball's chance in hell of getting a result in this game at Old Trafford? At oh, ah, I mean at Old Trafford. Uh, no, I don't even know if that helps them. It, to be honest, it, still no. <laughs> um, no, what I saw from City this weekend, I, it was interesting, right? Um, they dominated that game against Brighton, and we never know which Brighton is going to show up. Brighton had flashes. They created almost nothing in the first half. And then the second half, City looked like they got a bit complacent, and they would just, as a team, not individual players, as a team and a defensive unit, just fall asleep at times. 
and allow runs in, allow like deep, deep run. Matoma, I mean, Kyle Walker had his number most of the game, um, but there was one one run in particular where he looked threatening and every other defender on city's back four was like, Oh no, no, Kyle's got him. I don't have to worry about it. Mark and my man. And then everybody was free. Um, that's how their goal was scored is that city's entire team just kind of shut off for 20 seconds. I think United can score, uh, but I do not think they get a result. I think this is city three nil three one. I think the um, United playing at Old Trafford actually hurts them in this game. I think that hurts. they hurts them, hurts United because they, if they had any chance in this type of game, they're going to have to sit back and just like absorb as much pressure as they can. They've got guys that you know can hit somebody on a counter. That's their only hope. But when you play at home, especially Old Trafford, it feels like the crowd is going to be yeah, all on them. To yeah. you know, go do something, make something happen, have at least a little possession, and I feel like that that that's going to hurt them in this game. And I I don't give them a, any chance of, of getting a result in this game. I think you're right. Three zero sounds about right. Tommy, disagreement? Uh, no, no, yeah. no disagreement. But like United's always good for a surprise, but. True, you know, and they've they, in this derby they've they've they have pulled some done better, yeah. Yeah, but I still, uh, I yeah, I still think City. I think it could be a tough week for Ten Hag there if he I loses know. that. I was gonna they say, go, what is it? I they, had they this play right Newcastle. Now. They play Newcastle midweek, and then they go away to Fulham. So if you lose those first two games, you're knocked out of a cup. Let's say Champions League result doesn't go their way or something. I think. Uh, Ten Hag might be having a, a reunion with Ajax pretty soon. Yeah, and Ajax is now coachless <laughs> at the moment. Yeah. yeah. Be noted. 17th in Eredivisie. Oh. They've, been, they've been awful. When was the last I, time they were that low in the league? I don't know, especially this late in the season. I saw they lost 4-3 yeah. this past weekend. You can't score three goals and lose that game. Um, yeah, Manchester United, the, the Champions League game coming up this week is Copenhagen at home have to win that have to win that um yeah i guess we'll see i i, I do think i if you talk to or if you read from like the the big jays who you know are in the know about what's going on inside the club they say that ten hogs job is not on the line at this point why? but why not i don't know i don't like, know that's exactly what you say United right before you have fire some standards <laughs> some standards wait what did you say Tommy? I said, that's exactly what you say right before you fire him. True. That's true. But usually it's the team that issues a statement saying, you know, you know, our, we're, we're firmly committed to uh, Mauricio Pochettino and then, you know, fires ass a week later. Um, it's, I don't know. We'll, we'll see. I, I do think this week could be telling for him. If, if, first of all, they have to win that game on Tuesday against Copenhagen at home in Champions League. They can't get walloped at home by city that would be bad newcastle obviously a tough game just a tough week tough tough week um and i i've been on i've been on team ten hog and sort of the the it's been a slow evolution it hasn't been a revolution but it's been it felt like he cleaned out a lot of the riffraff a lot of the dead wood from the roster it felt like they were moving in the right direction but over the last couple of weeks maybe even months it does feel like they've just kind of stagnated. And I still don't know what the team is all about. I, I like, I, you know, when you go out there and, and watch, you know, uh, Tottenham these days, you know what they're going to bring to the table. You know how they're going to play Arsenal, same thing. City, obviously uh, the teams have these identity that you sort of, you know, United, I don't really know what, what they're all about still under Ten Hag. So that's, I think, um, you know, uh, uh, not a good thing, not a good thing. So we'll see. Interesting week ahead. As I said, not a lot of, in terms of the other games, I mean, Palace hosting Tottenham. Every time we go there, we stink. Uh, maybe this is a new day for us. I don't know, but I always have a weird, just an uncomfortable feeling every time we go to Palace. Chelsea you guys got... will be a consistency test for Chelsea. Yeah. See 
see if this is like an actual run of form or if it's actually or if it's just kind of like they've they've hit a couple flashes in the pan. Yeah, I think that's a good one to see what they're whether they actually have turned the corner a little bit. Um, Wolves, by the way, quietly, uh, they've got a win over City. They've got a draw with Villa and they just beat Bournemouth. So Wolves are kind of finding a little bit of form out of. I wouldn't say out of nowhere, but now they got Newcastle coming to town this weekend. So I guess that could be actually be an interesting game. If you can stomach everybody's watching second, Wolves. Everybody's second favorite teams, Brighton and Fulham. Brighton and Fulham, yeah. I, I mean, Brighton, that just feels like a game Brighton absolutely wins. Like, uh, I don't know. I'll say one thing uh, that I forgot to mention about the Brighton City game. They had James Milner starting at right back. And... and <laughs> They had Doku up on the left wing. And that, honest to God, watching that for 45 minutes, they subbed Milner off at halftime, as they should, which was probably even too late. Watching that for 45 minutes felt like elder abuse. I genuinely <laughs> felt bad for James Milner having to defend Doku. It was to the point where, like, later in the first half, they started feeding Doku. They were like, no, no, left, 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 left. And you saw Bernardo Silva, um, I'm sorry, you saw um, Rodri just, like, directing traffic to this left wing because every time Doku would get the ball, he was like a like kid in a candy shop. He would run right at him. His eyes lit up. You saw it from up in the stands. Um I, I don't think James Miller can start it right back anymore. I'm sorry. <laughs> I love the guy. I love his body of work, but that was a travesty what just happened there. Yeah. As somebody who has been in Milner's shoes, uh, you know, <laughs> when you're staring down the, the <laughs> you know, uh, bullet hole of a, uh, of a 22 year old who's lightning fast. I know what that feels like and it stinks. So Yeah. Shout out to James James Milner somehow still being a Premier League player at this point. Good lord! Um, <clears throat> all right, there we go. Kind of a, a mediocre weekend coming up, but the Manchester Derby obviously is a big one. Round the world, real quick. We're going to go MLS preview, playoff preview, and this is going to be a really quick one. We'll have Tyler back on. I think next week he'll give us the full rundown. And remember the format. It's weird. I know. Nobody really understands it. It's always different. And so we, what we got is a wild card game on Wednesday. Wednesday, we got eight versus nine playing uh, in the East and West. And that is a battle. It's a one-off wild card game. They will then face off against the number one team in the East and West. So on the West side, we got uh, Sporting Kansas City and San Jose. Uh, facing off on Wednesday, and then also Red Bull, New York, and Charlotte. And that's for – sweetie, you got to go downstairs. <laughs> okay. Um, so that's for a – okay. Come on, sweetie. <laughs> okay. We're going to have to pause here for just a moment. Okay, interruption over. Um, so the wild cards, one-off game on Wednesday. We got uh, Red Bull New York hosting uh, Charlotte and Sporting Kansas City hosting San Jose. And that is for, uh, basically it's a one-off and they get to play the, the number one uh, ranked team. And it's a, the first round, so not the wild cards, the first round after that, it's a round of three or a best of three, excuse me. So, you know, one will face, so St. Louis on the West will face either Sporting Kansas City or San Jose, and it'll be a best of three. The, the, I mean, there's some great matchups in the, we're looking ahead to the, to the round of round of three. I really hope, um, I really hope the wildcard games are interesting. That'll get people sort of at least a little excited about the MLS playoffs and sort of draw some attention. So I hope those games on Wednesday are good. I know, you know, Charlotte, uh, score on and get scored on a bunch um so that they, they should be fun san jose kind of the same thing um so i'm excited for those then on the weekend um we get started and like on the east we got all sorts of you know historical matchups philadelphia hosting new england orlando and nashville seems like they play in the playoffs like every single year at this point so they got probably good a little rivalry going columbus now in the falcons fc that's the one that I'm most interested in in the West. There's going to be so many goals in that game uh, or in those games. So Columbus, Atlanta, overs. I'm loving that. On the West side, um, Houston and RSL. Those are two teams. I, I Tyler was the one that pointed out 
Houston as being sort of sneaky, uh, dangerous. I think the same goes for Royal Salt Lake. I think the team that comes out of there, I really hope St. Louis makes a run and I will be rooting for St. Louis, but I do think that the, if St. Louis can get past the first round against Sporting Kansas City and or, uh, or San Jose, I think that whoever they face the next round is going to be tough. Um, and there we go. Seattle and Dallas and uh, LAFC Vancouver. That rounds out the, the field. Uh, I'm excited. We'll have... We'll have maybe an MLS player on next week. Tyler will be back. We'll, we'll get a real in-depth look at, at some of these uh, matchups, but it's time to get excited. Now the playoffs happen. Cincinnati, they got their shield, but now, now the real shit goes down. Okay, quickly, Champions League, by the way. Champions League this week, we mentioned uh, Manchester United needing to beat Copenhagen um, at home. That is a huge game for them. There's a ton of good games. Um, Newcastle hosting Dortmund obviously stands out for, you know, hopefully Reyna, who just had a great game uh, coming off the bench for Dortmund at the weekend. Um, even though Dortmund didn't play that well, he was awesome. Hopefully he keeps that going. PSG Milan, obviously also U.S. ties. Um, I'm just excited. It's, Bar- it's, you know, it's Champions League, and we got all these games going on at the same time. This is when, like, Champions League is awesome. Um, and over betters. Oh yeah. It's a good time of year. It's a great time of year. All right. Stoppage time. Let's put a bow on this episode. Um, we will start. Um, I'll throw it to you guys. Although the, the Ivan Tony's best bets over train has been cooking, cooking, still cooking. We're cooking with gas. So we're coming off of last week where I got five for five this past week, four for five. Not too bad. Not too bad. Um, so the overtrain is cooking. I will throw it to you though, Mitch. Do you you got uh, anything for the the people before we get uh, you know the next iteration of uh, the hot hot overtrain? I do. Um, both Champions League games, both games that are kind of favorites at home, but I think you get pretty good uh, money, especially Benfica money line against Sociedad at home. That's plus money right now. That to me. Um, Mikey saying rings true. Never bet against a Portuguese team in the Premier League. Benfica just just love a, a Premier League. For, I mean, I'm sorry, Jesus, Champions League. Long flight. Um, and then Inter Milan uh, minus one against Salzburg at home. Not one and a half. I just like minus one. Get safe there. Um, should bring you to like plus two fifty. I've been I've been really kind of trying to be conservative lately with these because I uh, I realized that for some reason, five leg parlays don't hit all that often, which is crazy because I've heard success stories. Um, so I'm trying to do like a little two and three, you know, just be, be a little, little, little smarter about it. Yeah, yeah. Be a little realistic, a little pragmatic. I, I don't mind that. I don't, I don't put that. the I don't put the hours in that you do looking up your overs because you seem to hit with uncanny consistency. Um, lately. It, it, I go it, off vibes and gut mostly. So yeah. don't take my picks. Whatever I say, just a word of caution for anybody that listens to this podcast, don't tail me at all. Just don't do it. Uh, you're going to hit it this week, though. You're I know. Hit it this week. Because I've said that um, both of those are going to hit this week. Right? <laughs> there you go. Tommy, anything for uh, for the people? Yeah, I'm going with the first-time meetings, or it seems like first-time meetings ever between clubs in Champions League. And I'm going overs for all of them. Oh boy. Uh, like Young it. Boys City, Newcastle Dortmund, um, Antwerp Porto. And then the last one I had was Benfica Real Sociedad. Wow. I'm going off the head to head on Fop Mob, and it's all said that they haven't played against each other. I don't know how far back that dates, but it seems like it's a first time meeting or a first time meeting in a long, long time. So I'm going with goals, goal fest and all those. Wow. I love it. I love that. I love your the optimism of, of your, your pick on that one. Uh, okay. Okay. Over terrain time. We're following up our, our five for five week and then a four for five week. And we got five more. Remember one per day, Wednesday through Sunday. So we're going to start out on Wednesday in Liga MX where Juarez and San Luis are going to give us a lot of goals. I feel it. I know it. Thursday, we're going Europa League. Brighton hosting Ajax. Brighton scores all the time. Ajax can't get it out of its own way. But, you know, they've also got a lot of talent. So I see a lot of goals in that. Friday, we're going to Germany. Bundesliga 2, 
Gruther Firth and Osnabrück. Uh, a lot of goals in that. Saturday, we're actually going to stay in the Germany, but we're going to go up a league to Bundesliga, Augsburg, and Wolfsburg. The Bergs, they're giving us goals. I feel it. I feel it in my bones. And then Sunday, A-League, you know I love A-League. So we're going Adelaide and Melbourne City. History suggests that they, when they play each other, there's at least five goals. So this, this another another good week. I'm feeling good about. I hope we get another four for five, maybe even five for five. But let's uh, let's keep this train going. And finally, let's finish up. Go is time. Everybody's favorite segment. Mitch, I know you're ready to go. What do you got for us? Um, I do have a couple for you. One is the 17 year old lad Mark Gay who scored 23 seconds into his Barcelona debut. I know I'm butchering the pronunciation of his name, but I'm sure I will learn because we're going to hear a lot more about this kid in the near future. Um, I think it was his first touch too. Might've been his second touch on the ball. Um, That is, you you can't script something better than that. And then it was in a game, by the way, that they had gone however many, you know, 80 minutes with like, it was zero zero, but there zero, were very zero, few yeah. chances, and yeah, he just was, came on and scored a goal. Barcelona have been such a second half team this season. Like if you look at their results, they're trailing at the half sometimes, often level, but like sometimes trailing at the half. And Xavi always pulls something out. I don't know what, but who knows? Um, and then my second one, we alluded to this earlier with uh, Michael Bradley. But my second one is Christine Sinclair, a Canadian legend who announced her retirement, not by not through a uh, a year long send off season, not through even the Federation, but simply through an Instagram post of a pair of boots being hung up on a goalpost with very little text or copy to accompany them. And she just kind of told everybody to draw their own conclusions. Um, and people were like, wait, did she, Did you just retire? Did you just, I love that. I love that move. Just an Irish goodbye of a, of a famously international retirement. Like that is, that is absolute A1 work from Christine Sinclair, a great player, a great Irish goodbye as well. Um, she's my go this week. Fair enough. A, a great move by Goal Scorers Union, uh, a loud and proud member. So shout out to Christine Sinclair. And it's good that we don't have to face her anymore. Because I feel like she, you know, if Canada ever scored goals against us, it was, it was always her. Um, Tommy, what do you got for us? I have uh, San Diego Loyal for, I guess, also hanging their boots up um, in fashion. Hell of a game. And I really enjoyed playing against them. Great fan base. Seemed like they really did things the right way, and it's kind of unfortunate that it's ended the way it has. But, you know, a lot of respect for the guys that play for that team and, and that organization. Yep, tough situation. Um, I actually meant to give them a shout-out in the beginning when we talked about San Diego FC, so I'm glad you did. But, yeah, they went out with a bang. That was a hell of a last game um, against Phoenix Rising. And, um, yeah, it's just a tough situation. Never like to see that kind of thing. Um, and it felt like they, you know, they went about things the right way, even right till the end. So, so shout out to the, the loyal management, the players, the fans, it stinks, but, uh, you, you, they had an impact, you know, on, on soccer in America. So, so thank you for all the work you guys did. Um, my goas this week, uh, a couple honorable mentions, the pitch invader who tried to get a selfie with Messi, but instead had his phone ripped away and thrown across the field by, uh, Pedro Galice, the Peru's goalkeeper shout out to him because he's now contemplating legal action. <laughs> if you actually follow through, you are a real dickhead. Um, also short King, short King, shout out, uh, Lucho Acosta, the shortest pro- player on the field in the, uh, Cincinnati Falcons FC game scored on a header. Well done, sir. Um, then the, um, an original, so I just saw this on Twitter. I don't know him, Dan Gorman. He's like an original sons of Ben member. Sounds like he, he passed away after sort of a tragic bike accident. I know there's a, a you know, a number of sons of Ben who listen, um and that's just a tragic situation obviously anybody who's put that much time and effort into you know growing a supporters group it's a hard uh, slog so shout out to to dan gorman and his friends and family and condolences to everybody who knew him uh my my goal for the week will go to jose Mourinho. 
content god. Um, not only did he show up in Brazil doing some wacky dance uh, that I, you know, posted on Instagram, which actually was not him. At least I don't think it was him. Um, but the the content god himself got this was over the course of about thirty seconds. So um, Roma scored a game winning goal. I think it was might have been in in stoppage time. He, they score the goal. He turns to the the Monza bench and gives them like the crybaby look and tells them to like stop talking and you know just you know you know you know Jose being Jose he gets a red card for it and just a beautiful just Jose making content out of absolutely you know nothing at least nothing that he should have been involved with in terms of content just Jose being Jose and that's why he's the content god and uh, I will always love him for that as long as he's not coaching Katadam. All right, guys, Tommy, Mitchell, you guys are the best. Thank you for hopping on. Um, everybody else, thank you for listening. Thank you to my seven-year-old for making a brief appearance earlier. And uh, we will see you guys next week. Ay, ay, ay.